Hi guys, it's me. Chapter three of Jolly Pigs All Loses Control. This chapter is called Storybook Land. Mom was disappearing down the road. Dad was shifting around in front of me with his arms and legs crossing back and forth like he was sharpening knives. Oh, he was wired. No doubt about it. When I looked in a mirror, I could see it in my eyes, and now I could see it in his. Even with my medicine working real good, I felt nervous inside. He was so hyper. Now I knew what Mom meant when she said he was like me, only bigger. He was taller than me, too. He had long arms and pointy elbows, and a humming sound came out of his body as if he was running on an electric motor. Oh, I took a deep breath, and even though my insides were churning, I was determined to stand there and be as stiff as the rusted-up Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. Well, Joey, Dad said with a grin rocking back and forth on his face like a canoe on the high seas, you could call me Carter. And he stuck out his hand to shake. I knew I'd never call him that. But before I could call him the one important word I'd, been waited, I'd waited so long to use, Grandma stepped forward. Truce, she barked, and stuck out her wrinkled old hand, which looked like a dried fish. Since you're going to be here for a while, we might as well get along. She had her hair cut short and slicked all the way forward with something so shiny I thought it was covered with Christmas tree garland. Come on, Grandma pestered and poked her hand forward again. Don't make me think you're not happy to see me. I squinted back at her because the sun reflected off her hair and directly into my eyes. No, I said, and began to say that I was happy to see her. Because the last time I saw her, she'd been walking off down the street, and I figured she was washed down the sewer drain where I found her shoe and nothing else. But she jerked her head back before I could say no. No? She squawked like a parrot. Did you say no? Well, I can already see that you've stopped. Well, I can, all, I can see you already that you stopped using the good manners that well, I taught you. And you, that I taught you when you lived with me. I have manners, I said with my voice sounding tight. My mom makes me use manners. Have I done anything wrong yet? No. Have I said anything mean? No. I'm polite still hadn't moved an inch except for my mouth, which was now all oiled up from defending myself. Grandma clamped her lips together and turned away to glare over at Carter. I told you, that person lets him run the show, she complained, and then she gasped for breath. A cart leading the horse. Carter kept whipping around and finally an uneven, so uneven sound came out of his mouth like a car engine that wouldn't start. Then he waved his hand in front of his face as if it were a magic wand and suddenly he went from a stutter to full speed talking. I've been thinking about what we should do today. I have the perfect idea. Instantly, he was full of energy and happiness, and he smiled real big and announced we were going to Storybook Land Fun Park. You've got to see this place, he said. It's where my whole life turned around. I wasn't sure what he meant. If his life turned around when he was a kid, that would mean it got worse. But if it turned around as an adult, that would mean he got better. Hey, this thing is heavy, he shouted, lifting my duffel bag. What she got in here? Well, some clothes, shoes, trumpets, books. I was trying to picture it all like it was on the list Mom made for me. Well, did you bring your baseball glove? He asked as I followed him up the porch. Because I'm coaching a team and I could use a ringer like you. No, I don't have one. Ah, don't sweat it, he said, plopping my duffel bag down inside the front door. I'll pick up one up for you this week. Now let me see the size of your hand. I held mine up with my fingers spread wide open and he did too. When our hands pressed together, I felt a jolt, like as if he had a joy buzzer in his hand. We piled into his big old car and all the way to storybook land, I imagined playing baseball. You know, I was pretty good at throwing rocks, so I figured I'd be pretty good at pitching. I wanted to tell that to dad, that I would love to play on his team, but I couldn't get a word in. 
He just kept talking and talking his non-stop sunny talk about what a great summer we were going to have, and that he had tons of plans, and that we would get caught up as father and son as soon as our rough past and oh sorry, and soon all our rough past would be behind us, and we would have nothing but smooth sailing in our future. He especially kept talking about storybook land. You gotta gotta see this place. Just gotta Grandma sat next to him with grace clouds of cigarette smoke over her head, as if her grumpy mood had set her hair on fire. Finally, Dad said, you just gotta see it, for the hundredth time, and she yelled at him. Okay, Carter, we're on our way there, for goodness sake. Give that motor mouth of yours a rest. She was going to say more, but she got choked off by a coughing fit. Dad continued talking his fast talk, and when he took a breath, I tried to tell him about wanting to play on his baseball team, but he cut me off like a clueless driver, and he kept going, so I just listened, which was okay with me because, well, it made him happy. I figured I'd tell him when I had a chance, but for now it was enough that we were together, even if he was talk or taking me to a place which was way too young for kids my age. He was trying to get to know me, so it was fine. We had to start somewhere, and maybe in his mind, I was still a baby. After we got out of the car, Grandma announced she would allow Dad and me some time alone to get caught up while she played miniature golf. Gonna work on my short game, she wheezed, then bent over, hacking with her hands on her knees. When she finally pulled herself together and stood up, she said, Should have brought my oxygen tank today. Smoggy. Well, that, Mark, is brought to you by Kepler, the, how old is she? Nine-week-old puppy. So we have a nine-month-old and a nine-week-old. <coughs> See you later, Grandma, <coughs> I said as nicely as I could because she was a handful when she got mad. Dad and I headed down a little stone path lined with flowers and a short white picket fence that wasn't tall enough to keep <coughs> out the squirrels. And as we strolled, teenagers passed by dressed up as storybook characters. They waved at us, and when they smiled, their painted face wrinkled up like strange masks. We waved back. The wolf from Little Red Riding Hood howled at some cowering kid who screamed and clutched his mom's pants. Dad nudged me with his elbow and said, Ha! Your granny could eat that whole wolf alive. I think so, I said, then added. But why does Grandma need oxygen? Emphysema, he said, from smoking. She can't get a whole breath and now, now needs to carry around one of those oxygen tanks. But some days she's too embarrassed to do it. I just hope she can get through golf, okay? Me too, I said, imagining Grandma slumped over the miniature windmill or halfway down the little wishing well. It wasn't funny. The first exhibit we came to was the sad-eyed Humpty Dumpty. Now from Dad's build-up, I was expecting something very fancy. There was only a painted, half-cracked concrete egg leaning against a cinder block wall. All the king ho king's horses and men were made of carved wood and staked into the ground. They were tilted one way or the other, and they were splattered with mud. Well, this is where it happened. Dad whispered. He squatted down and wiped the figures clean with his handkerchief. Right on this spot. And he drew an X on the ground with his finger. This is where my whole life turned around. I wandered in here late one night having had too few many drinks. I passed out. The next thing I knew it was morning and a girl dressed as little Miss Muffet was waking me up with her shoe and telling me to move on or else she'd call the cops. I stood and stared over old Humpty Dumpty, and I thought, I'm as bad as he is. I'm nothing more than a teary-eyed, busted-up egg. And as I left the park, I thought, man, I could learn a lesson from that Humpty Dumpty dude. So the next day I came back and just stared at him, and the more I stared, the less I liked myself. I didn't want to be a pathetic, broken egg with everyone trying and failing to put me back together again. I decided on the spot that Humpty was never going to get better. He didn't have the willpower to stop whining, get off his can, pull his old self together, and move on. Right after that, I went to a clinic, 
and I dried out. And whenever I get a chance, I come to pat and polish old Humpty's head. Believe me, I've been in every clinic in Pittsburgh, but not one of them taught me a lesson more valuable than what I learned at Storybook Land. You know what I mean, he said. He turned toward me and waited for me to say something. I think I know what you mean, I said. But I wasn't quite sure if when last year I was sent down to the special ed school, I had become a Humpty Dumpty who had to glue himself back together again because I didn't do it myself. I had a lot of good people to help me. You know, Dad started up again, flapping his arms around as we were strolling along the path past the three pigs. This isn't a kitty park after all. I mean, everything here... I see it gets me to start to think. Dad, could I talk for a while? I asked. Oh, nobody's stopping you, he said. Two people can talk at once. It's like watching TV and talking. It's no big deal. Yeah, Dad, but it's really hard for me to do. I want to listen to you. Then I want you to listen to me, and let's go back and forth like people who want to know about each other. Well, sure, we could do that, he said. Now keep talking, and we'll go down to Jack and the Beanstalk. Man, that is one place where I really did some deep thinking about you. The beanstalk was really just an old telephone pole painted green with wide metal leaves running up both sides. Check this out, Dad said. And he scampered up the pole as if he had done it a hundred times already. At the top was a giant's balcony. Dad stood on it, shaded his eyes with his hands and shouted, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of a little one. I laughed at him and shaded my eyes, too. Fee, fi, fo, fum, I boomed. I smell the blood of a great big bum. Joey, he said, making a sad, humpty face. There's not a man alive who wouldn't feel some guilt for abandoning his kid, but I'll make it up. I'll think of some way to pay you back for all I've done wrong to you. We were apart for a long time, but from now on, I swear I'll stick with you. And if you disappear again, I'll sniff you out like the giant, and I'll track you down. I stared up at him, and he looked huge, as if he could see around the entire world and sniffing me out no matter where I was. Half of me loved it because he was saying we would never be lost from each other again. The other half was a little scared, because if I wanted to get away from him, it meant I couldn't. I couldn't run or hide or disappear without him finding me. Joey, did you get what I'm saying to you, son? This place made me think. He squinted and thumped his forehead with the palm of his hand. Think, like never before. Dad, I asked, looking up at him as I stumbled forward. Can we do something a little bit more fun now? Well, yeah, I guess we could take a break from all this thinking. We climb, or He climbed down the beanstalk and swung me around and nearly snapped my neck. Sure, let's go get your picture, our picture taken so we can always remember this day. And then we could go on the bumper cars to, in the park. We walked down the path and he continued talking nonstop. Now look over there he said and pointed, to, and pointed to Goldilocks and the three bears in their little house. We can learn so much about each other here. How hot do you like your porridge? What's porridge, I asked. I never ate any. I'm going to go let the dog out. I'll be right back. I'm back. See, he declared, now I know something more about you. And before I could ask him how he liked his porridge, he said, okay, now who's smarter, Hansel or Gretel? Uh, Hansel. He tricked the witch with the chicken bone. Now what do you, oh look, he said, there's the old lady who lived in a shoe. She had so many accidents, she didn't know what to do. And there goes that kissing fool, Georgie Porgy. Oh, I know how he feels. I knew how Dad felt about everything. But Dad didn't know how I felt about anything. 
All the way to the photo booth, he kept pointing out storybook characters, and he had something important to say about each one. But after a while, I stopped listening because he didn't know if I was listening or not. There it is, he pointed to the picture booth. We went over, and I sat on the big mother goose, and Dad put his face in the cutout head of the, two, of the Jack of Hearts. The photographer took two pictures, one for me and one for him. You know, we better get one for your mom, too, he reasoned, so she won't think I've got you hanging by your thumbs down in my basement. I thought that was a great idea, and when the photographer said smile, I thought of Mom, and I got a big lip-curling grin on my face. Okay, Dad said, slipping the photos into his po top pocket. Let's hurry up, because there's a few more important story spots I need you to see. Well, what about the bumper cars? I asked. In a minute, this next thing. Oh, it's important. We walked down the crook to the crooked house, and right away, Dad bent over to one side and began to play as if he was all crooked. Now, this is me before, he said with a wavering voice. All crooked. Then he straightened up like a soldier at attention. And this is me now. Do you get it? Once there was a crooked man who lived in a crooked house. He had a crooked dog. When he said dog, the breath went out of me like I had drowned on land. <gasps> no! I left Pablo in the glove box. Who's Pablo? he asked. My chihuahua. I cried out with my feet hopping up and down. I have to come on. Come on. Where's the payphone? And I looked around like, they, like there might be a little crooked phone in the little crooked man's house. Well, why is he in the glove box? Because he got car sick all over the radio, I said. And I took off running down the path to where I'd seen the log cabin bathrooms and a payphone. By the da time Dad caught up to me, I had the money envelope out of my pocket, was ripping the tape off the quarters and popping them into the phone slot. And now I didn't know how much money it would take, so I figured putting them all in would be a good idea. You know, she probably hasn't even made it back home yet, Dad said as he took the phone from my hand and hung up. All the money came shooting out of the change return and went rolling across the floor. I have to get home, I said as I scrambled for the coins. What if Pablo is stuck in the glove box when Mom returns the car and Pablo is trapped in there and dies like kids that get trapped in car trunks? Joey, don't turn into a Humpty Dumpty on me. You have to tough it out, buddy. Everything's going to be all right. Why, I bet your mom found Pablo after a while, turned around, and brought him back. I bet he's on our front porch right now waiting for you. Well, let's go see, I said, right now. Dad took my hand, and we went toward the miniature golf course. Grandma was sitting on a small brown and white polka-dotted mushroom seat with her golf club across her knees. I've just been taking a breather, she whispered harshly. We've got to go home, Dad said, reached for her elbow to get her on her feet. Joey lost his chihuahua. What chihuahua? she asked. Nobody told me about a fancy rat dog was part of this deal. Dad didn't say anything. Instead, he scooped her up into his arms. I was already heading for the car, and I wished I had the keys because I'd started up and take off looking for Mom and Pablo. All the way back to the house, Grandma said mean things about my fancy Mexican rat dog. But he's half chihuahua and half dachshund, I said. Mean half rat, rat and half wiener? She shot back. No, be quiet, I said again. No, you be quiet. We kept this up until we pulled into the driveway and I jumped out. And there was Pablo on the porch, shivering with the handle of his leash fastened around the front doorknob. Mom had written, I miss you already, in lipstick in the little diamond-shaped window. <clears throat> I grabbed Pablo and I kissed him all over his pointy face and he kissed me back with his awful dog puke breath. But I didn't even care. I loved him and he loved me and that's all that mattered. See, Dad said coming up from behind me. I was right, wasn't I? Yeah, he was. I set Pablo down and threw my arms around Dad, Dad's neck 
and just hugged him as tightly as I could because he was totally right and didn't turn into a humpty dump a busted up humpty dumpty when I had. How did you know he would be there? I asked. Well, that's what dads are for, he replied all jolly and hoisted me up on his shoulder like a sack of flour. As we entered the house while Grandma and Pablo growled at each other, I figured they were going to have a heck of a time because neither one of them was ever going to back down from anyone or anything. Hey, Dad, guess what? I want to play baseball. Well, that's my boy, he said, a chip off the old block. Then he kept talking. And I stopped listening. End of chapter three.